The announcements are printed in the back of your bulletin. You can follow along with me or listen as I read them. We would appreciate everyone signing the friendship register and passing it down the road so that all have a chance to register your attendance. If you have a new email address or haven't given one to the office, please do so as you sign the register today. We will continue our Wednesday evening Lenten study in the Fellowship Hall at 7 p.m. on March 28th. Eight from our church will join the intergeneration mission trip, leaving the church parking lot at 2 p.m. today. Please pray for these as they travel and work together in Annapolis, Indiana. They will return home on Thursday evening. Uh, you will be able to purchase a spring garden plant, depending on availability, to decorate our sanctuary for Easter. The price will be the same as last year, $12.50. If you would like to purchase one in memory or honor of someone, please note that on your check. You may include the cost of the flowers with your regular offering between now and March 22nd. And the auction ends today at 2 p.m. Uh, so if you haven't made a bid or would like to, you need to get downstairs and do that. JYF meets today right after church. And Anne, do you have an answer? I know it's been printed in the newsletter and the bulletin, um, but I wanted to remind you all of the open house March 28th from 1 to 3. Um, this is a community open house, and it's for those in our community that might be curious about what our renovated sanctuary looks like. Um, there is a sign-up right over next to the kitchen over off the parlor. Um, we are in need of some tour guides, um, some people to greet at the doors, um, someone maybe a couple of people to help serve cake. Um, we are doing a lot of publicity for this, um, so our Probably our, our best publicity, though, is all of you. If you can think of someone, whether it's your neighbor or someone at your coffee group that you've talked to about our sanctuary renovations, this is a great opportunity to just invite them in. Um, there's, we'll have just handouts that we'll be giving out that day that will share some information about our Easter services, but um, it's really just an opportunity for people to come and see our new space. We'll have... Um, some pictures running on their projector so people will be able to see our screen they'll be able to see the process but if you could especially here in the next week or so begin to think and invite those that you come in contact with on a daily basis um, we would love to have a full house that day um, at two o'clock so the the program or the open house is from one to three at two o'clock we'll have a special special presentation um, the mayor will be here to to do something a little fun with us as well so hopefully um, that will add a little a little spark to the event so um, just look for things in the newsletter and again tell your friends and um, please sign up in the parlor because we're in need of a couple of volunteers that day thank you And now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude.
For those who are able, will you please stand for the call to worship? We come together to worship the God who loved us and saved us through grace. We are not saved by our own doing, but by the love and grace of God. So let us come to worship this amazing God whose love is beyond understanding. Hallelujah and amen. Please join with me in the invocation. Most. Will you join me in the invocation now, please? Most holy and wonderful God, we come with open hearts to receive you today. We have prepared ourselves for your presence with us here. Come and enter this sacred place of worship with your love and grace and kindness. Fill us so that we have full flow and touch the lives of others. We ask in your name, Amen. Will the children come forward now? Good morning. Good morning. Are you ready for spring break? Yeah. yeah, are you sure? Are you going to do lots of homework? Oops. Are you going to do lots of homework? No. Are you going to do lots of studying? Lots of reading? Lots of math? No. What do you guys do on spring break? 
have fun, nothing, sleeping in. You, oh, you are going to do a little reading then, but just for fun, not for school. So, well, I hope you guys have a great spring break. I'm going away on spring break with some other people. We're going to go to Indianapolis and do some work in food banks and different places, a refugee um, place, and we're going to have a good time. So I hope you have a good time here. Is it better to give or to receive? Give. Give? Receive. Receive? (laughs) Come here, Drew. Give me a high five. (laughs) Honesty is always rewarded. Um, Sometimes it is better to, to receive, isn't it? Sometimes it is better to give. I agree with you. All of you who said um, give, we should give you guys high fives too. Um, it is, why is it better to, to sometimes give? So people, whether in Africa or close by, might need food, so we could give food. Good answer. Taking care of people when the weather is bad. That's a good thing. When is another time that it's good to give than receive? Christmas? Uh-huh. Drew's going to be honest with me again. It's, it's good to give and receive at Christmas time, isn't it? Have you ever heard of a word, grace? Yeah. We used to call my sister that because she tripped over everything. And we said, way to go, Grace meaning that she wasn't very graceful when she fell over things a lot. We would say that. Um, We would be joking about that. But there's grace in the way of church. Do you understand what grace is at church? Have you ever heard that word at church? What? Yeah. Huh? We did. We just sang a song, Amazing Grace, didn't we? Um, Amazing Grace, how great the sound that saved a wretch like me, or a soul like me. Some people change that word sometimes. Um, do, you, do you understand what that grace thing is? How about this? Um, do you do chores for allowance? Sometimes. We'll just go with that. So let's say you do chores for allowance, and you're supposed to get, what, two bucks, five bucks, a dollar, whatever. And um, what if... One day, instead of getting $2, you got $5. Or instead of $5, you got $10. <laughs> Too much honesty gets you in trouble, Drew. <laughs> so, um, so let's say, would that be great? What were you supposed to get? Two bucks. And you got five bucks. That's like twice as much more. Is that wonderful? Well, that would be a lot times more, and I would love a day when I was trying to get $2 and I ended up with 100 That would be amazing, wouldn't it? That would be amazing. But you know what, Drew? You, you make a good point, because with God's love, we always get way more than we're supposed to. God understands us and loves us and cares for us in ways that we can hardly imagine. That's grace. When you get more than what you were supposed to. When you get more love than you're supposed to, that's God's grace. When you get more kindness than you're supposed to, that's God's grace. That's God's grace to you. Now, that is something good to receive, isn't it? It is. But today, I'm going to make a case in my sermon, and maybe you can in Children's Church think about this. If we receive that grace and we follow Jesus, aren't we supposed to give that grace too? Yeah. Yeah. We're supposed to give that same kind of grace. When people anger us, we should be more patient. When people aren't kind to us, we offer kindness back. When people are in bad situations, we offer love. This is what God does for us, and it's what we can do for others. Will you pray with me, please? God, we give thanks for everything that you give to us, especially your love and your grace 
and your kindness. Help us this day to truly understand what grace is, the abundance, the over-giving of you to us. We give thanks for that, and we pray, God, that we can be more like you and more like your son and provide grace to this world in many ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Yes, sir. spring can you feel it in the air is it not on is it just not on me better 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 i'm on down here right all right there we go we got it we got it so um i would bring to you the concerns and celebrations of the congregation as we know them this day i would mention again our mission team um, I ask that you be with all of us that are going on that. For those of us who are going on the mission team that are in the sanctuary, please stand up, and they're all right over here. <laughs> there are five of us. Gina's here, but I think she's helping with Ch um, Children's Church, and we have two people that we're picking up along the way, Kristen Mahana, who usually sings in the choir about right here, I think, and, um, oh, and Natalie Workman, who is in Indiana celebrating a milestone birthday for one of her grandparents. But if you will keep... The five of us and the others that I've just mentioned in, our, in your prayers this week, we would, be, we would greatly appreciate that, wouldn't we? You may be seated. Thank you. I'm looking forward to spending um, time with these folks this week, representing you in Indianapolis. And um, so when you hear stories about Gleaners Food Bank and Good Samaritan Ministries and a refugee com um, organization that we're going to be doing work with on Thursday... These are the folks who will be telling you those stories, and I look forward to you hearing about those things, about what we as a church will have accomplished. We know that um, Betty Landis remains on our prayer list. Shar and John Carden share with us this day that they have a granddaughter who's about 22 years old. Her name is Shannon, and she's had um, several biopsies on Friday and awaiting test results, so please keep the Cardens and their granddaughter in your prayers. Florence Washburn has been in the hospital um, most of last week, and she was in isolation unit for pneumonia, and she's struggling, and I know that Norma's struggling um, with her, so please keep Norma Kentner and her mother, Florence Washburn, in your prayers. Dave Kentner, our property chair, sitting right over there, is going in for hip surgery tomorrow. So by Tuesday, he should be all better. <laughs> and ready to go, right? No rehab necessary. So Dave, um, know that we will have you in our prayers as you go through the surgery tomorrow, and we hope to hear good news. And hopefully within a short amount of time, you will be feeling better. We, we pray for that. Pray again for Norma Kentner, who will have to be taking care of Dave also. Um, <laughs> so we keep Jason Stewart and Jean Cooper, who's right over here, and I'll come back to Jean in just a moment. Glenn Potter, Brad Becker, Don and Carolee Smith, Jean Johnson-Moore, and Manil McClure in our prayers. Um, Kenneth Deal, who is Heather Bailey's um, father, stepfather, is struggling with some aneurysm issues, and so we keep him in our prayers, and you, Heather. And um, Jean has just been accepted into a new cancer study, and so leaves tomorrow to go to St. Louis, and uh, will be there for eight days, and then home. And he'll be back and forth to St. Louis a little bit, but not quite as much as before. And so we're thankful for that. And we're hopeful for the study. And you have such a great attitude about it. We're just, we, that helps so much. And so good luck. Know that our prayers are with you. I know that these are not all the prayers of our congregation, but these are the prayers that we are aware of at this time. And so with all that is in our hearts and on our minds, let us go to our God in prayer. Let us begin our prayer in silence.
gracious God. We come into the sanctuary this day continuing our Lenten journey, intentionally striving to know your ways better, to understand your son, to understand his life, and incorporate these ways of living, these great ways of faith into our lives. As we are about halfway through the season, may lessons be learned May lifestyles be changed. May we draw closer and even closer to you that our community and our world can be different. We seek to understand how it is that you can love us, that unconditionally you will care for us, that without question you will lead us to a life that is better than we could ever imagine. We believe that for the life after, but help us to believe that for the present life, that life can be so good because we can be drawn closer to you, that we can know you in such a personal way, that we can live faith in almost every moment. We often think of the word grace and what it means to us and what it means for us to receive it. But this day, God, help us to understand that we participate in the grace process, not as just a receiver, but as also a provider. Living in the ways of your son, we can help others to know of your love, your kindness, your friendship, So be with us this day to be courageous enough to share your grace with all those to whom we come in contact. We pray for those that we've mentioned this day and we pray for those whom we've left unmentioned. May your grace extend to all in need. This is our prayer this day offered in the name of the one whom we call ourselves disciples, your son, Jesus the Christ, who has taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may have noticed that our interns are not with us today. They're on a well-deserved spring break this Sunday and next Sunday. Except for Tad. We didn't let him go. (laughs) Actually, Tad came in this morning uh, on his own. He's going on our mission trip, which is wonderful. Tad Goldner. And so I had to assign him a solo for the anthem this morning. So you'll hear Tad's voice right at the beginning of this anthem.
Let the people of God say amen. amen. That was so nice. Thank you very much. Tad, thanks for sticking around. That was great. Our scripture comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It's printed in the bulletin if you'd like to read along. If you'd like to listen, that is just fine. Let us hear the word. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. On the front of your bulletin, you will note the Lenten theme, crossings, moving from one place to another, kind of like a bridge or an intersection, that opportunity to move. It's not a place to stay. It would maybe sometimes even be too dangerous to stay as Things might come from behind us or above us too early. And so um, we are moving in Lent. We are not staying still. We are moving forward towards something, towards something better than we know right now, towards something greater than we have right now. You have this much faith? By the end of Lent, may it be this much faith. You have this much because the world has beaten you down and you haven't been in those places where God has gotten to you. May you have this much. This is Lent. A moving forward intentionally in faith. Crossings. Crossing from this faith to that faith. And so we find ourselves here on this day with the action verb gracing as our sermon title. Lauren Hill, not the famous singer for those of you who might be a little younger. Lauren Hill is a basketball player for a team in Ohio, Mount St. Joseph College. She has brain cancer. The beginning of the season was coming, but her treatment was causing her to probably miss the whole season. All she's ever dreamed about was being a basketball player and getting on the court and showing up and playing, you know? She played all through high school. She was playing for a college. That's what she wanted to do. But her treatment schedule wasn't going to allow her to get into her first college game. There's a disciples school, one of our denomination school, also in Ohio, called Hiram College. And somewhere along the way, Lauren's story got to the coach at Hiram. And they decided that instead of waiting 10 days to start their season, they would play early so that Lauren could have that taste of being on the floor, that she could get into the game, that she could play college basketball. So they did. They moved up the game by 10 days. No one was really ready. They were expecting a lot more practice before they opened their season, but they decided to play anyway. Well, the media got a hold of the story. And many people 
got so interested in this game that they had to move it from Mount St. Joseph to the Centos Center in Cincinnati where Xavier University plays. There were so many people wanting to come, professional athletes, professional coaches, media of all type. Pat Summit, who's going through her own kinds of issues with Alzheimer's, who's, she's won more basketball games than anybody at the University of Tennessee women's program. She had to retire a few years ago because of Alzheimer's. She came to the game and presented a Courage Award to Lauren Hill. The two teams met the night before. Who does this? You never meet with the team you're about to play. They met the night before. They had dinner together. They got to know each other. They got to talk. And, you know, they had a play designed for Lauren right off the tip-off. It was called Lauren's Play. Hiram didn't have to show up early to play this game 10 days early. They didn't have to have dinner and get to know the team members from Saint, Mount St. Joseph. They didn't have to kind of lay back and let Mount St. Joseph win the tip, make two passes, give the ball to Lauren underneath the basket for a left-handed layup. They didn't have to sit on their bench with tears in their eyes for someone who was a teammate on the other side. After the game, the Mount St. Joseph players and Lauren Hill were amazed by the attitude and, dare I say, the grace of the team from Hiram. says something about the character of that coach, the character of the girls on that team. Grace extended to another, to one who was suffering, to a team that was struggling for their friend, for their teammate. I believe that's what we're supposed to be about. I believe that's what we as disciples of Christ, that's what we as people of faith, that's what we as receivers of grace are supposed to be about, extending that grace to others. Paul writes in his letter to the church at Ephesus in this chapter, this beautiful chapter about grace that I think is really confusing at times. The front end especially seems a little confusing. He talks about the fact that we were all once lost, that we were all once deep in sin, that we were all taken by an evil one, the ruler of the air, the spirit, who is still hanging out with those people who are disobedient. We once were those disobedient people. That's what Paul is saying. But that something bigger happened, something that we didn't control. God showed up. God was God. God acted to the very nature of who God is and said, I will lift you up. If you will only believe, I will provide a way for you to live a life that is not sinful. Paul goes on to say that that way is, is through Jesus. Jesus. That as he came, we were able to, those of us who will be his disciples, those of us who will pay attention to him, those of us who will live as he lived, we can understand life in a different way. We can rise up from a life that is more like being dead than alive. And we can be alive. That we can live in that faith. And that grace, that grace is not anything that you or I can do to earn. There's nothing about it that is about me. When it comes to grace, that is all about God. And it is a gift, Paul says. Grace is a gift 
to you. For by grace you have been saved. Too often we like to take credit for the things that happen in this world. In fact, we're supposed to. We're supposed to take credit for it because if we don't take credit for it, no one's going to give us credit for it. If we don't take credit for it, we'll never get that step up. We'll stay constant. We won't move forward. But the ways of faith are not like that. Because when it comes to grace, there's nothing, nothing you can do to earn it. The end of the scripture, though, is really important, I think. Because I think we talk about grace, and we talk about receiving that grace, and having that grace being a free gift from God to us. But, but Paul puts something there at the end about works. You haven't been saved by your works, He's clear about that. But there at the very end, he talks about the fact that if we follow Jesus, then we will be called to good works. They won't save us, but they will call us to help others to not live a life that is dead, but to become alive in faith, to know this grace by which we know God. It's one thing to receive God's grace, but I think it's another to extend it. It's another to help others to come to know this great message of unconditional love and kindness and friendship that we know. Paul doesn't say, have that grace and just sit there. He adds that little bit about, well, if you follow Jesus, then you'll know these good works and you will do them. In my way of thinking, we will extend grace to others. Don't get caught up in, for by grace you have been saved and there's nothing you can do about it and no work that you can do that will ever save you. That is all correct. But Paul doesn't leave it there. He calls us to move. Calls us to live faithfully and gracefully. Fiend Perkins likes to think about this section of Paul kind of like in addiction recovery mode where people who have been addicted have to come to terms. They have to say, this is who I am. They have to have some self-reflection, some self-recognition and then they begin to move beyond. They begin to move to a place where they recognize that they have to share their life with others. They have to apologize and say, I'm really sorry about that. It's an important step of moving on is that apology. They have to realize that they can't move alone. They cannot move alone to get out of the, the, dredge, the dregs of addiction. They have to depend on the help of others in AA and other organizations like that. People will have sponsors who will help them through tough times. And even in the midst of all of that, there is God. That at the ultimate end of it all, there is God. They move because they have help, and the best help is divine. Grace Perkins says, I saw this guy, David Anderson. He preached at the Orlando Assembly, and he's written this book called Gracism. I love that title. Do you like that title? Gracism. He can preach. And the reeds, we all heard him. He can preach. Hear what he has to say. I define racism as speaking, acting, or thinking negatively about someone else solely based on that person's color, class, or culture. A common definition for grace is the unmerited favor of God on humankind. 
extending such favor and kindness upon other human beings is how we Christians demonstrate this grace practically from day to day. When one merges the definition of racism, which is negative, with the definition of grace, which is positive, a new term emerges, gracism. I define gracism as the positive extension of favor on other humans based on color, class, or culture. I'm from Oklahoma. I root for the University of Oklahoma when it comes to basketball, football, gymnastics, it doesn't matter. That's the school I rooted for growing up in the state. It was either Oklahoma or Oklahoma State. Never would we root for any team in Texas. The school that I didn't attend but root for was in the news this week, right? You've heard about it. You've seen. A fraternity, S-A-E, on their way to a party on a bus started a chant. Racist. Do you think they might need to hear these words about grace and moving from where we are to a new place? Do you think they might need a bit of a journey? A lot of people are worried about these boys. A lot of people celebrate the university that acted swiftly. Some people criticize the university for not doing more to educate I don't know how we overcome these things institutionally. I don't know how anybody could expect Oklahoma to do anything differently than they did. That was uncalled for. That was sin. Now, what do we do with that? How do we move forward? Maybe this book has something to say about that. Taking something that is negative and adding that to something that is positive. Maybe gracism is something we need to have more conversation about in this country. Maybe we need to try to begin to see beyond color lines. And how can we do that without the grace of God? So when he says... I define gracism as the positive extension of favor on other humans based on color, class, or culture. I think he would even extend that, that gracism to those boys who stood up and made a bad mistake, who maybe have bad role models in their lives, who maybe are a part of an institution that may be racist at its core and has been for a long time. He might say, how do we begin to work to raise them up as well as the people they offended? He closes this chapter by saying these things. When we we repent of our sins personally, corporately, and nationally... We then can begin to rebuild on a new foundation. Radical conversion and forgiveness change the heart of a person. Therefore, unless we go through repentance over the sin of racism, we Christians are battling the problem of race just like the world, namely, without God. But if Christians put God in front of any problem, that problem will diminish because God is bigger than it. I'm not just saying that it will keep me as a black man from getting stopped by police officers when I'm traveling in neighborhoods that make them suspicious of me, but the God in me can give me the grace to handle such incidents with patience, kindness, and forgiveness. He says, a gracist reaches across ethnic lines and racial borders to lend assistance and extra grace to those who are different on the fringe or marginalized, this person or group can be of any color, culture, or gender. Are you 
a gracist. The heart of a gracist extends a helping hand to those who are outside the positive norms of a particular society. While the majority may enjoy the hidden rules of a particular sociological group, gracists build bridges of inclusion for those on the margin. I'd like for you to see a story of someone who received help from three young boys that I'm going to say are gracists, someone who was marginalized. You'll see. An inspiring story out of Kenosha, a student being bullied at a junior high school basketball game caught the attention of the basketball players. And those players walked off the court to defend her. Michelle Fiore reports from Kenosha. Well, this is where it all happened for Desiree Andrews. As she was being bullied from these stands, a couple of boys on the basketball team said, enough's enough. And that's where this bullying situation turned her life around. Desiree Andrews no longer walks to class alone. Students have been drawn to her after a situation that could have taken away this pretty smile. The kids in the audience were picking on D, so we all stepped forward. Andrews has Down syndrome. These three boys were in the middle of a game when they heard something upsetting directed at one of their cheerleaders, a girl who dances to her own beat. So when I heard that, they're talking about her like it kind of like made me mad. Basketball players stepped to action, walked off the court, and asked the bully to stop. It's not fair when other people get treated wrong because we're all the same. We're all created the same. God made us the same way. D and the boys are now eighth graders and last night played their last game in the gymnasium that they have affectionately dedicated to their friend. Are they calling it something special? Yeah. What is it? D's house. D's house? Yeah. How does that make you feel? Good. The athletic director tells us the name has stuck. He's planning to make a banner officially calling the gym D's house. What did your family think? I think they're sweet, they're kind, and awesome, and amazing. Sweet, awesome, kind, and amazing? Yeah. Well, Desiree's next step's high school. As for her future, she says she wants to be famous. We think she's already famous. In Kenosha, Michelle Fiore, today's TMJ4. She's pretty famous already. It's Dee's house. She is. I loved how those young men stepped up. Hey, great job. A f what do you think of that? Three eighth grade boys who were able to see beyond their world of a basketball court. I have to tell you, when I was in eighth grade playing basketball, I never knew anything that was happening beyond that court. Do you ever get that way in your life where you don't see beyond your own schedule? You don't see beyond what you can see, what's happening in your life? These three junior high boys said, no more. No more. And to a young girl, known to them as D. They extended grace. What does it say about their nature and their character? What does it say about the young man who stands up in front of a news reporter's microphone and says, we're all created the same. God created us all the same. God loves us all the same. God extends grace to us all the same, and God extends the same call to all of us, especially those of us who call ourselves Christians, to do good works and share grace. Their basketball season has ended, and the principal has followed through with what he said. The the, the gym is now known as D's house. This house is God's. And here we receive. 
we receive grace and we receive a call to extend grace. What will our nature be? What will our good works say about who we are? My friends, they will say everything about who we are. May God's grace guide us in our best moments and even in our worst. We can depend on that anyway because that's just how God works. Amen. When we think of those big church words like love and grace, we know that we find them when we come to this table. There's something about receiving this bit of bread and this bit of drink that remind us that we're loved, that grace is surely extended to us, that we don't walk alone in this world. So as we go through this Lenten journey, may we feel those things. May we find that love. May we know that grace as we gather around the table today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the living God, and at your table we gather. When our lives feel dry and barren, your spirit moves among us, and the dry bones of our spirits come to a new life once more. Bless this bread that we break and eat in imitation of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through this act of obedience and remembrance, 
May we grow in discipleship and in love for the Savior who came and died to bring us new life. May your spirit quicken us so that we may receive and reflect the new life you offer. In your son's name, amen. As we come to this table today, Lord, we ask forgiveness for our sins we have committed against you and against any of your children. We read the words in grace and forgiveness. We try again to be the children you would want us to be. Send us now the Holy Spirit to guide us in all our efforts to follow the Christ. As we drink from this cup, help us strengthen us and walk with us on our near path. Amen. When Jesus sat at the table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. And after the meal, he took wine and he blessed it. And he poured it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my blood shed for you. Each time you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. Let us remember the one who inspires us to live in such a way that we can receive and share grace. Let that grace be present with us in this meal.
either to accept or reject Christ, but once he or she accepts Christ, it is not for that person to decide whether or not to be a steward. For one becomes a steward when one becomes a Christian. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. The deacons will now accept your gifts. Gracious and holy God, as we make this offering to you this morning, help us keep our lives focused on you. Amen. I invite you to discipleship. I invite you to be gracists, to go and live this faith that is yours, this gift of grace that has been freely given to you. If anyone would like to become a member of First Christian Church, I invite you to come down as we sing our closing hymn, which is number 73. There is a wideness in God's mercy. Let us make promises and let us be prepared to leave this place. We've announced it.
Go forth from this place, renewed, refreshed, full of God's love and grace, ready to share that with all to whom you come in contact with this day and always. In the name of the Christ, amen. Thank you.